Father, we thank you for your word as we open it today, praying that you would open our minds and hearts. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're continuing in, and uh, what do I do with my clicker? There, I guess. We're continuing in Hebrew. We've uh, talked about uh, uh, today's sermon is, jumped ahead, sorry that I did that. There, we're around in the bend. We've talked about slippery slope, talked about uh, another curve, and now we're rounding the bend. And uh, let's read our scripture. We'll see what we're talking about. About him we have many words to say, and hard to interpret, seeing as you have become dull of hearing. For although by this time you should be teachers, you again need to have someone teach you the rudiments of the first principles of the revelations of God you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is not experienced in the word of righteousness, for he is a baby. But solid food is for those who are full grown, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. Therefore, leaving the teaching of the first principles of Christ, let us press on to perfection, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works, of faith toward God, of teaching of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. This we will do if God permits. As we've talked about, the writer here in, in uh, Hebrews is trying to, he's talking to the Hebrew Christians of the day, those Jewish people who have accepted Christ as Savior, who have turned from their faith of Judaism, and who are struggling, struggling in a world just because it's a struggle to do what's right, to follow God when so much is leading us to go wrong, but a struggle also because they had their kindredmen who were coming against them. And so the writer here and God through the scribe that wrote these words down is encouraging them to stand firm. He's encouraging them that their faith is greater than the angels who are mighty and powerful and who do the bidding of God, who are created by God. He's reminded them that their faith is greater than the law of Moses, who was the, the great lawgiver, the certainly the one that figures so largely in Jewish culture as he led them out of Egypt, as he led them to the promised land, as God gave the Ten Commandments through Moses and all the teachings that were so important. And so Moses figured so highly, but, but the, the text is going on that Jesus is greater than Moses. And today we get in to where Jesus is the great high priest. He's the final high priest. He's the high priest forever. And it says in the order of Melchizedek, there's not a lot in the Bible about Melchizedek. He's only mentioned in Genesis with uh, Abraham as Abraham had completed a battle and uh, had, con had conquered and gotten Lot, his nephew, back and had the spoils that the Melchizedek came as a priest to Abraham, and Abraham gave him a tithe of the goods, and that was the first time we see that occurring in Scripture, that offering of that to a high priest. Melchizedek is uh, said to have had no beginning and no end, and that doesn't mean he was a mystical person. It, uh, the, the scholars basically believe that means nobody knows who his parents were, where he came from, but he was a priest before the order of Levite priests that God established through Moses. All the other priests that came after were from the tribe of Levi. And the scripture in Hebrews, as you, as you read on and as you read, brings out the point that all of those priests that served the Jews all those days were men, were humans like themselves. They were flawed. They made mistakes. They sinned. And before, uh, though they were charged to serve before God and to go into the tabernacle, into the Holy of Holies, they had to go through cleansing rituals to get the cleansing, the uh, covering of their sins before they could go in before God on behalf of the people. 
and in this holy of holies that was constructed in the in the wilderness, this tent, this tabernacle, there were uh, there were actually three sections. There was the outside courtyard that, of course, any of the Jews could go into. Then you went into another room uh, that there were several of the artifacts in there. And then there was finally a holy of holies, another room, and no one went in that room except once a year. And it was so... Uh, it was so powerful in the chant and actually deadly in the sense that whenever the priest went in there, again, he had to go through rituals to cleanse uh, himself from his sins so that he could go in and do offerings on behalf of the people that their sins might be covered. They would tie a rope around his leg so that if he died while in there serving, they could pull them out because no one was allowed other than the high priest and that once a year to go into the Holy of Holies. It was that sacrosanct and that's where the Ark of the Covenant was and some other items that were in there and it was uh, it represented the presence of Almighty God and man because of his sin is not able to go into the presence of God. You and I uh, cannot go into the presence of God except that Jesus Christ having died for our sins and us having received that and received the forgiveness of our sin makes us clean and righteous before God and we can commune with him. That is the powerful difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Man could not be in the presence of God after the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden sin got in the way and so the there was always this chasm this this break between man and god but when jesus christ came he bridged the chasm he made it possible for you to go into the presence of god for god to come and commune with you and as i said there was a curtain separating those two rooms uh, in the in the temple there in the desert and when Jesus Christ died on the cross, there was a similar heavy, heavy curtain separating the, that section in the temple that was built in Jerusalem. And when he died, the scriptures tell us it was rent, it was torn from top to bottom. And it was a symbolism that Jesus Christ, having died, opened up that passageway to God. And it's also important to note that it tore from top to bottom from God to man it was no man that grabbed it at the bottom and rent it up but God tore that veil down and after that time there were no other priests needed Jesus is the great high priest the final high priest interceding for us daily and so that's what this passage here is getting into and talking about about Jesus greater than angels, greater than Moses, greater than the law, and greater than any other priest that existed. And yet he is a very compassionate and empath empathic, uh, pre empathetic priest because he lived as we lived. He grew up as a child. He went through those ordeals. He got hungry. He got thirsty. He knows the challenges that we face day to day. So he is able uh, to relate to your problems and to uh, have that communion with you and that fellowship. And so the, the, the writer here, God, is going on with this teaching here, and it gets very pointed here when he starts there in, in verse 11. We have a lot to say about this, but it is hard to explain because you are slow to learn. Slow to learn or dull, and that's our third word today. We've talked about drifting. Uh, now that's the second. Uh, come on, Wes, where is it? Looks like the computer's let me down. I had a whole power. There we go. Maybe I got fast fingers today. But we've talked about drifting away from God which is often not intentional. We just kind of follow our own way. We just kind of seek our own thing and we find ourselves 
kind of wandering away from God and uh, being distant from Him. And, but then we start having doubts come in, and we, we know that the accuser plants those doubts. And we talked about how Satan, the, through the serpent, came to Eve and, and, and implied, did God really say this? You're not really going to die. And he implanted doubt. And we have doubts that come into our mind, and, it's, it, uh, and we deal with those. And whenever we decide to rationalize and start considering our doubts to start giving them weight, we start placing ourselves and our wisdom over God. And as we continue down that path, we become dull. We become slow of hearing. We become uh, uh, untuned to God's voice. And that's the, that's the slippery slope that I've been talking about that we're moving on using that illustration. And that path away from God is failure to grow as a Christian. We can become stunted. And this has nothing to do with our chronological age. It has, uh, we can be babes in Christ and have many years under our belt. We can be young in Christ and have great wisdom. It really has nothing to do with age, and age living a long time is no guarantee. As we fail to grow as a Christian, we remain students instead of becoming teachers, and the scripture says that by this time, you should be teachers. And that time was not very long, really. Uh, this was uh, before 70 AD, before the fall of Jerusalem. Jesus died about 33 AD, so we only have about 40 years total there. And these people came to Christ sometime in that period. So the, the writer here uh, is saying, you should be teaching this by now. You shouldn't be having to be taught these basic principles. And he compares an infant as to mature. And we, uh, again, we can draw that analogy. We understand an infant, we start out with milk. We start out with mother's milk and, and strengthening them. And then as they grow, they drink more. And then finally, we move them to solid food. Milk, for all it's good for a child, for a, an infant, it has antibodies, it has other uh, properties that keep them healthy and strong. It is not sufficient as their body grows to provide the nutrition they need. And so we move them to solid food that has the protein and the vitamins and the minerals that a body needs. And so it is as Christians, we start out with the very simple concepts of faith, but then we should be moving to more maturity. And, and the, they even talk about here the point being perfection. Perfection is, is knowing it all and having it all, and we should be moving towards that. We know it won't accomplish until that day he calls us home, but that's our goal. We need the solid food versus milk, and we need to get beyond repentance. That's one of the basic teachings to righteousness, which is becoming like Christ and being like Christ. So these are some of the ways that we fail to grow as a Christian, and we have that, that path away from God. And so what are the elementary teachings it talks about here? It says you should be moving beyond the elementary teachings, and uh, starting at verse 6, and teaching of salvation, including repentance. All of these concepts are vital, important. It, needing to move beyond them in our education does not make them more trivial or less important, but they are the foundation of our faith. They are beginning of our faith. Salvation is crucial, and if one has not accepted Christ as their Savior and Lord and made that personal decision, that's where they need to start, is to understand their need for salvation, their need to accept Christ as Savior in order to please God and to have entrance into his, uh, his heaven, into his presence. And that is the start, and that comes from repentance. Salvation uh, is, is joined together with that understanding that we sin and fall short of the glory of God, and we need to choose 
that we're not going to go against God anymore and we're going to move in His direction. Repentance is turning from one way to the other. That's a very foundational, a very important. We cannot go on walk of Christ until we get to that understanding. But, and then we grow into a sure faith in God instead of our intellect, instead of our understanding, instead of our reason, instead of our feelings. We go by, we walk by faith. We live by faith in Him so that when things don't make sense, when things are bigger than ourselves, when things are more than we can handle and we can't understand, we rely on Him. We trust in Him. And the, we, we move on from baptism. Again, baptism is a very crucial point of beginning as a Christian. We are commanded to be baptized. We have the example of Christ to be baptized. And we go through that to show our fellowship with Him and to show as a testimony to others the decision in our life. Again, very foundational. The laying on of hands. Uh, this harkens back to Acts chapter 6, and it was uh, where the, the first deacons were called, but also other activities in the church where some authority, some, some um, belief in the person was conveyed by the laying on of hands. It was not an actual transfer of any power. It's more recognition that they have given their life over to Christ. They're striving to work for Him. And so that is recognized. And that laying on of hands is that term that we've turned into ordination. We ordain deacons. We ordain pastors. But in a simple definition, it is just a recognition through the laying on of hands that this person is called by God and set apart for His service. Resurrection of the dead seems a mystery, but it's a basic understanding that Christians should have that when we die, we don't become dust in the ground. We don't only become dust in the ground, but our soul is resurrected to Him. And we are taught in the Scriptures that on that day that He, that he calls things to an end, our spirit and body are reconfined into a combined into a glorified body. The resurrection of the dead should be a basic fact and understanding and that there is an eternal judgment. These are all elementary teachings that the book of Hebrews talks about. And again, some of these uh, may seem very deep to you uh, and they, they can be, but they are things that as young Christians and as new Christians, we learn very quickly and we accept in faith. And the, the writing here, the scripture has said, we need to move on from that. You see, we can get stuck here. We can get stuck just talking about salvation and wanting to hear that. We can get stuck on about baptism and how it should be done. We can get stuck on all of these different functions and never go on to the full life that Christ wants. And we can get stuck on them to the point that we are unable to teach them to others and help others become deep, devoted followers, devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And that's where this is leading us to. And so this is a pretty, really severe admonishment here to these Hebrew Christians, but by extension to us, that we need to be leaving these elementary teachings behind and moving on. We need to be moving on to fruits of the Spirit found in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, King James says, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control and goodness. These ought to be evident in our life. We ought to be constantly growing and, and these should be more and more evident to others in our life. They should be evident to us that as we face trials, as we face challenges, that we are resting in Him, that we become less stressed, that we become less anxious, 
because we know our Father so well. We know He loves us so much that even in times of trouble, we can have that joy, that peace, that patience for Him to work things out. So this is part of where we grow in maturity of Christ. But some outward, there should be an outward expression of an inward joy. Joy is more inward. We can have joy when things are going wrong. We can have joy when there's a bad day. We can have joy when we're not feeling well. Happiness is more of an outward uh, expression of what's going on with us. Uh, and it's hard to be happy when tragedy befalls us, but we can have joy through that because we know we have a God and a Savior who loves us, who cares for us, who's seeing us through, and we can rest in Him. But these are some ways that this inward faith of yours, of ours, should be expressed. One of them is excitement and worship. And I was trying to recall if I've told you the story of Florence Deddens. I think I have, but it bears repeating again. At my previous church, I was getting frustrated because uh, they weren't really engaging in the music the way I had hoped they would. Uh, mainly just kind of stood there and went through them. And so one particular Wednesday Bible study, I'm kind of venting a little bit and complaining. And Florence, bless her heart, spoke up and she said, Pastor, what it'll help you to understand is when we were young people, when we were children in our church, we were taught that you were to sit, be quiet, and be reverent. And a light went off. I understood what she was saying. Yes, that is the teaching. And we should be reverent before God. We should be quiet when something's being said and listen. We should be paying attention we shouldn't be up jumping around, but that should not be our total way we act before God. We have occasion throughout scriptures, we have multiple occasions where, where people rejoiced before God, where they played instruments, where it says even David danced before God. Have you ever been so excited in your faith, having such a great day with God, so blessed by what he's done? that you wanted to dance around the room, I have. I can't dance. It, it's a good thing for me to do by myself. But I've had that kind of joy to where I wanted, I just couldn't contain what was going on. I needed to express it or break out in song. When was the last time you were so enraptured with God that you just broke out with no one around, how great thou art? Or my heart in the morning when the sun comes up virtually every morning that song when morning gilds the sky comes to mind just god's beauty and we should have those kind of moments and we should express it and we should express it in worship i, I keep threatening i'm going to do it one of these days i'm going to use that camera right there and i'm going to take pictures of you while we're singing and let you see your faces. It's not real encouraging sometimes, let me tell you. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe you're just concentrating really hard. I, uh, maybe that's what it is. But I'm afraid that we've just gotten so in a rut with our worship, we've gotten so normalized that we don't express joy you saw me over there in the song today, or maybe you didn't, but in that, uh, Lord, I lift your name on high, there are those hands. You came from heaven to earth to show the way, from the earth to the cross, my debt to pay, from the cross to the grave. Lord, I lift your name on high. There's not a thing wrong with lifting your, you know, I, uh, there's a great video about lifting hands and kind of making fun of those of us who have trouble. And I have trouble with it. One of the ones a guy talks about is uh, the, the one who carries the TV. That's how they worship. They keep their hands down here. They're carrying the TV. And I, I'm kind of a TV carrier. It's a little much for me to get them up there. But that's just, really, it's just selfish pride. It's concerned about my image and how I look and what you're going to think if I really get it up there and I'm praising God. And isn't that a shame? 
Isn't it a shame that I can be intimidated to limit my worship of Almighty God when He's stirring my heart? We can be hesitant to break out in tears when our heart is being broken, when our heart is touched, when we realize how we're failing before God. We don't want to cry in front of others. But that's got to be some of the most blessed sounds to our Heavenly Father when our heart is breaking because we're breaking His heart. And we should be able to have that experience and to do that. Not to make it a show, not to get anybody's praise to look how godly they are. That's nothing that matter of fact, that defeats the point. But we should be moved emotionally in penance, meaning sorrow for our sin, and rejoicing. We should, when God confronts us and shows us what's inside of us, when he leads me to share something with you or someone else gives a testimony uh, about what God is calling us to and you realize you're falling short, then there should be a response coming to the altar and praying, uh, maybe even sitting down while everybody stands and having a quiet time of prayer before God. It is a hardened heart when God starts speaking and, and you just act like a statue. Nothing's happening. That doesn't honor God. And it doesn't help you respond to that. And just on the flip side of that, when God is moving, when there's a great song happening, you ought to be in some way emoting. And joy, I, I understand maybe getting both of them up at one time is a little hard. Uh, but there ought to be some expression in you of what a great God is. I know I could ask each and every one of you, has God done something great for you? We've had great testimonies of how he's seen, seen different ones of you through a departed loved one, a tragic loss in your life, or a, a difficult problem. Maybe it was personal surgery. Maybe it was the loss of a, of a spouse. But God has been there. And you can testify what a great God He is and how He has sustained you. Well, guess what? You ought to exult in that, rejoice. Give praise when you can instead of just being a sullen statue. These are things, a conviction of sin, that penance I'm talking about, whenever God does reveal to us, we should be down on our knees, figuratively if not physically, and in contrition before God crying out to Him, um, pouring out our heart. A love for God's Word. Is there a desire to be in His Word at least each day? Reading. I know you've read it before. Read it again. God's Word is so rich and deep that it speaks to us anew every day. And I, this is the way I talk to my Father, and I should want to talk to Him. This is the way he talks to me. I should want to listen to him. You know, very often on Facebook, that stupid questions go around, repeated and says, if you could have anybody uh, in the whole world to talk to again, who would it be? And one person I'd like is my dad. My dad passed away when I was 22 years old. He uh, succumbed to cancer. So I've lived longer now without him than with him. And I would just I would enjoy a little bit of time with my dad. And that would be a natural thing. If I had that opportunity, do you think I'd just kind of, well, I guess I'll go see dad now. No, I'd be running. I'd be doing, I'd cancel everything to talk to my father. This father here created you. He saved you through Jesus Christ. He turned you from a life of sin, from the pit of hell, to a life of abundance in heaven and here on earth. It kind of seems like it'd be natural to want to talk to him, to hear what he has to say, but we lose that love. We lose that love of worship. Worship is honoring God. It's about him, not me. 
The songs I left should be for him, not me. When I was, uh, I'm ashamed about this story, but, I, but, I, but it applies. When we were attending uh, Wright Baptist Church in Fort Walton Beach, Florida, Sue and I were in the choir. I hadn't gone into ministry, wasn't even thinking about ministry yet. We were in the choir. There are probably 20 or 30 of us in the choir. It's a pretty good size for choir. I, one time, not one time, this one time, I'm in the seat, and I mean, I'm just a fussing about the song the choir director picked. I just, oh man, this is an awful song. I can't believe he picked this. I hate this. And the guy next to me, who'd been hearing it, I'm sure, finally turned to me and said, who are you singing for? You or God? That was a dagger in me. Because certainly it was about me. And certainly I should honor that leader who had chosen this music in order to uh, try to proclaim God's word through song to the others. And certainly I should be able to set aside my preferences, my desires, and learn how to engage in worship. Certainly I should be able to set aside my petty wants to worship Almighty God. That's what worship's about. It's not about me being comfortable. It's not about me getting what I want. It's about lifting high the name of Jesus Christ and lifting it high so that others who don't know him will look to him. And if that needs to come through a way that's different than what I want to get them to see Jesus Christ, I need to have the maturity to do that. My salvation is sealed. I'm going to heaven. My, my eternity is settled. But there may be someone here on any given day that doesn't have that security. And so the service can't be about me. It needs to be about them coming to know the Father that I know. Sharing the gospel. I am convinced, and you, you may have done it in your family, that if you had someone in your family, typically a young person, going down a wrong path, maybe they're starting to dabble in drugs, maybe it's just uh, smoking, drinking, but maybe they're getting into drugs, maybe they're getting into a promiscuous lifestyle, and it's a niece or a grandchild of yours, or maybe your child. I would like to think that as difficult as it'd be to say something, that you'd try to say something, to turn them from that life that you know is going to be a waste for them. What about the person? What about the niece, the nephew, the son, the daughter that hadn't accepted Jesus Christ and you believe this word and you believe Jesus Christ's word that the only way to the Father is through Him? Are you burdened enough to say something to them? To try? To pray? That's the sign of maturity, of growing in Christ. Developing that maturity is confession and repentance. Just because you've confessed your sin nature and accepted Christ as your Savior doesn't mean me and you don't have things we need to confess to God each and every day. An attitude, a selfishness, a, 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 a disobedience, a not doing the best, and then turning from that and, and repenting, reading and memorizing God's Word. We need it in us. It's, it needs more than just reading it. Uh, James says, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. We need to have his word in us. We need to be taking the effort to memorize the Father's words. Praying to God. We, we might be pretty good about praying. Lord, help me in this. Do this for me. Get this for me. Lord, take care of my loved one. But do we pause to listen to what he has to say? The best conversations are two-way. The best conversations are a dialogue. 
talking and he will speak if we'll listen hearing and obeying and then burden and sharing some of these are uh, repetitious in thought but as we develop these attributes we are developing maturity in Christ and it's not just about us getting our jollies off one day a week or being comfortable or liking what's being done it's, it's communing with God and growing in Him and letting Him uh, and let His light within to where He illuminates something that we're holding back, that's keeping us from a walk, that's keeping us from a relationship with our fellow man, that's keeping our church from growing because I'm resistant and not following what I know God said to do. As we, as we take on these attributes and develop a maturity, God is able to work through us more and more to His glory, and it glorifies Him. There are these promises, two, two of them I picked out of the Bible. The thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come, Jesus is speaking. I am come that they might have life and that more abundant. Can you honestly say before God, and then not talking to me, not talking to the person next to us, that my life in Christ is abundant or is it just barely sustained? Jesus said he came to give you an abundant life. He also promised, God promised in Jeremiah 33, 3, call to me, I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. God is waiting to talk to you. He's waiting to show you great things. He's ready to expand your vision and to let you see things. Continuing on in chapter 6 to the end of the chapter, this summarizes again the greatness of Jesus Christ. In this way, God, being determined to show more abundantly to the heirs the promise of immutability of his counsel. That means it doesn't change. He, immutability means it doesn't change. Interposed it with an oath that by two immutable things, in other words, two things that don't change, in which it's impossible to God to lie, we may have strong encouragement who have, take, have fled for refuge, which we have from the sinful life, to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have is an anchor to our soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and entering into that which is within the veil, where as a forerunner Jesus entered for us, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This is not pie in the sky one day. This is not fanciful make-believe. It's not, it's not the Iliad and the Odyssey writings. This is truth that God has passed down through various people to you today so that you may know his word, you may know his desire for you, and you may hear from him how he would have you live, what he would have you do. And folks, if you're here today, he ain't done with you yet. There is that day coming for his appointed unto man wants to die and after that the judgment. One day, we won't sit here and we'll be with him in heaven. But that day ain't here yet. And so he has something to say to you. He has something for you to do to, for him, to him, with him. He has some body he needs you to speak to. We each have different people we influence. There are people I can speak to that you would have no influence upon and vice versa. It takes all of us sharing that message and it's real and it's sure 
And Jesus is that high priest who went beyond the curtain, the first one and the last one, so that you might have eternal life in him, so that you might be an instrument of his grace, so that others may be saved from a life of separation from God eternally. But we become dull. We become slow to hear. We drift away. We start doubting. We start questioning. We start using our own wisdom. We become dull. And the road doesn't end on those three. Next couple of Sundays, we're going to look at a couple of more steps down this path. God is moving. God wants to move. God wants you to move with him. But God and all of his power and all of his might isn't going to take your arm behind your back and force you down that path. He's waiting for you to obey, hear, and follow. Mm -hmm.